Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum everyone. So let's go over the uh, second lecture uh, in the neuroscience module. Uh, in this lecture, we'll talk about the biochemistry of neurotransmitters. So um, there are different resources for this lecture. Of course, the lecture itself. You can also refer to Mark's Basic Medical Biochemistry, the fourth edition. These are the pages. And there's a nice website that you can go to as well. Uh, it gives you nice information, not only in the biochemistry of neurotransmitters, but also the physiology and anatomy. So uh, let's start uh, by, by defining what a neurotransmitter is. So it's basically a chemical substance that, uh, one, it has to be synthesized in a neuron. It is released at the synapse following depolarization of the uh, nerve terminal usually as a result of influx of calcium ions. And then uh, once released, this neurotransmitter binds to a receptor on the postsynaptic cell or the presynaptic terminal. And once it binds to the um, receptor, uh, it, it, release, it activates a signaling inside the cell, resulting in a certain specific response. So in order to call a neurotransmitter a neurotransmitter, it has to fulfill a number of criteria. One, it has to be synthesized and stored in the presynaptic neuron, waiting for a stimulus. Um, so the enzymes that are needed for the synthesis of, of this neurotransmitter must be present in the neuron itself. Uh, it has to be released at a synapse following depolarization, as I mentioned earlier. And once released, it binds to a receptor uh, activating signal transduction in, on the postsynaptic cell or in some cases the presynaptic cell itself, uh, resulting in the activation of a signaling pathway that is rapid, um, but it's reversible as well. And then the neurotransmitter uh, must be removed um, in order or inactivated uh, from the synaptic cleft. Now, we will talk about some neurotransmitters and, and um, we'll talk about some exceptions to this definition. So this definition and these criteria are not really holy. So the reason for the existence of, of uh, exceptions to that definition is the presence of different types of neurotransmitters. So there are major, three major types. We have the small molecule neurotransmitters, we have the neuropeptides, and we have gases. So the small molecule neurotransmitters are more diverse or most diverse. Uh, you can have biogenic amines such as epinephrine, dopamine, histamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, etc. We have amino acids that they themselves can act as neurotransmitters including glutamate and glycine and to a certain extent aspartate. We have GABA that is um, put in this category uh, which is a modified glutamate. We also have acetylcholine and we have ATP also acting as a neurotransmitter. Then we have another uh, class of neurotransmitters known as neuropeptides and we have gases, uh, basically nitric oxide and carbon monoxide. Now, certain neurons can have more than one uh, neurotransmitter. So uh, a neuron may have uh, a small molecule neurotransmitter as well as a neuropeptide and both of them can be uh, released uh, simultaneously from uh, the same cell and these are some examples written here. So these are the different uh, neurotransmitters and how they look like, the structures, so the small molecule neurotransmitters, um, well you know, uh, they're small compared to neuropeptides that can have diverse structure as well in terms of number uh, and type of amino acids. And we have the ATP right here. So we'll start our talk with uh, on neuropeptides. So these neuropeptides are diverse. Uh, it's, it, it, well, the class contains diverse uh, types of, of uh, neuropeptides um, and they have diverse functions as well. So they can control behavior, pain perception, memory, appetite, thirst, etc. So when do we consider a neuropeptide, a neurohormone, or a neurotransmitter? 
Well, it depends on the site of action. So a neurohormone, for example, or we consider a neuropeptide as a neurohormone when it is released by neurons, but then it goes into the blood system or it goes into the lymphatic system and it acts uh, far away from where it's released. And as a result, these neuropeptides, uh, they are needed in small quantities. So um, when they reach the target tissue, they exist in uh, uh, small concentration in the nanomolar or micromolar range. Um, but their duration of action is long. Um, as well as their effect. And, and uh, at the end, we'll talk about differences between neuropeptides and small molecule neurotransmitters. So these neuropeptides can be considered neurotransmitters when they are released from a neuron at a specialized junction, uh, but then they act on neighboring cells, so they do not travel uh, far away from where they are released. Now, there are different types of classifying neuropeptides uh, they can be grouped um, as shown in this small table. So you can have the tachykinins, insulins, somatostatins, gastrins, and opioids. Um, again, th they can have different structure and, and function as well. So if you focus more on the opiate family, uh, they are small peptides. Actually, well, you know, they, they, they can have a small uh, number of amino acids, such as the uh, six amino acid encaphalins that only differ uh, in, uh, in having leucine or methionine. Now, notice that the endorphins are larger than the encaphalins, and they do contain the same initial uh, four amino acids. Then we have the uh, dynorphin, dynorphins um, that also contain the same four uh, amino acids as well as different uh, sequence of amino acids, different primary structure. So if we look at um, examples uh, specifically on neuropeptides, we have the vasopressin and the oxytocin. We talked about these two in general biochemistry. Now, these two are made of nine amino acids and they share seven of these amino acids, yet they have totally different functions. Now, we talked about the opioid family uh, and how uh, they share a common sequence, but uh, they, uh, the rest of the sequence is totally different, as well as their, the receptors that they act through. And then we have three uh, large hormones. Uh, these are the um, uh, thyroid-stimulating hormone, the luteinizing hormone, and the follicle-stimulating hormone. They have the same alpha subunit, but they have a different beta chain. Now, the way these neuropeptides are synthesized is basically uh, through, or they are synthesized on or in ribosomes that are attached to the surface of endoplasmic reticulum, uh, specifically uh, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So they are synthesized as pre-pro-hormones or peptides, and the pre-region is the region that specifies uh, that this is a a protein or a polypeptide that has to be uh, synthesized on the surface of ER and it has to be inserted into the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, as it's translocated into the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, the pre region is uh, cleaved. So the propeptide now exists in the endoplasmic reticulum and it gets modified. Uh, by glycosylation, cleavage, sulfation, etc. Uh, then the, it travels into the Golgi for further modification and then uh, into large, dense core vesicles. Now, these vesicles are characterized again by having um, a thick uh, membrane as well as having a large size. And um, you have the propeptide now inside these vesicles along with the modifying enzymes. So as it travels along uh, microtubules into the uh, synaptic terminal of these cells, uh, the propeptide pro is modified by these enzymes. So in some of these peptides can, uh, can be converted into the active form inside these vesicles. Now, once it is in the uh, synaptic terminal, 
um, it uh, sits inside these vesicles awaiting the influx of calcium the signal that is uh, that results in influx of calcium and this influx of calcium results in fusion of the vesicles to the plasma membrane and release of their content now once they are released they act they bind to uh, receptors on the postsynaptic cell surface uh, mainly these receptors are G protein coupled receptors um, and they are removed by diffusion and degradation. Now some of these neuropeptides as I said before uh, they can go into the lymphatic system or the blood system and they travel uh, far away from where, where they are released and they act on uh, distant cells. So these neuropeptides are quite diverse and there are a number of processes that result in their diversity. So even though some of them are synthesized from the same gene, um, you can have the messenger RNA alternatively spliced resulting in the formation of different protein isoforms. An example is substance P having uh, different uh, exons. Now the other thing is um, is that once they are in the, the protein form post-translationally, that is, uh, the proteins can be uh, processed further. So a great example is the pro melanocortin precursor, a large polypeptide that can be cleaved differently in different tissues by different enzymes resulting in the formation of different hormones. So you have proteolytic processing that creates diverse number of hormones from the same gene and the same protein precursor. Now the, the thing or what determines this diversity is the, um, is the enzymes that exist uh, inside these cells. So you can have different enzymes in different cells resulting in uh, different cleavage of the uh, precursor protein. The other thing that can determine uh, how the peptide is cleaved is that it can be modified by glycosylation. So this glycosylation can mask a cleavage site of this peptide. Again, this whole thing is tissue and cell specific. Now, an important point that I'd like to mention here is that these neuropeptides are localized inside large dense core vesicles and they wait for calcium influx. Now the site of where calcium goes into the cells can be far away from where the these from where these vesicles are located. So they can be far away. Okay. And as a result of that the concentration of calcium that is needed to to, to uh, promote the fusion of these vesicles with the plasma membrane must be high enough, uh, or I should say higher than the calcium concentration needed for uh, small molecule neurotransmitters to be uh, released. So we have different levels of, um, of, of regulating the expression of these neuropeptides. One, it's the stimuli can be different in different cells, uh, resulting in production of or activation of transcription of different genes, uh, alternative splicing as well. Uh, then we have the formation of um, uh, proteins that are, uh, that are differentially expressed in these cells. Uh, these proteins can be modified differently in the Golgi uh, apparatus. Uh, and once inside vesicles, you can have different uh, co composition of uh, enzymes inside these vesicles, resulting in the formation of different uh, neuropeptides. Now, once they are released, uh, these neuropeptides diffuse away, either uh, to, to limit their action, or they diffuse or they go into the, the blood system or lymphatic system, traveling far away where they can act on uh, in, in peripheral tissues. Uh, once inside, they can also be proteolized, they can be cleaved by proteases, either uh, terminating their action or modifying them further. So this is the uh, first part of this lecture. Uh, we'll continue with the small molecule neurotransmitters.